started the recording and today's topic is going to be about how to pass more tests. Some people call it how to take tests, but you can take a test and not pass it. I want you people to be winners. So I'm going to talk about how to pass more tests and to get higher scores on them when you pass them. So let me turn my slideshow on. And here it comes. Waiting for it to load. All right, can you see my first slide there? Can you see my first slide? Is it visible to you? Oh, yes, sir, it is. OK, good, good. All right, then I'm going to talk talk my way through this thing. And at the end, we can take some questions if you have any, but I think it's going to be self-explanatory. And again, remember, I will send everybody the link to this video, and I'll also post the link over on our Canvas website. So if you want to take notes today, that's good. But if you want to review it later, that's fine too because I want to leave all of these resources in our website and build us up a nice uh, study library. So let's see if uh, move right ahead to the next slide. Are you seeing it full size? Because I have it in my notes view. Are you seeing the slide uh, big or are you seeing all the upcoming slides too? You should just be seeing um, only the one slide right now. Sorry, my my um, AirPods are just disconnected, but now I can hear you. So I could see it. It says read over the entire test and all of its instructions. Right, but are you seeing it full size? Yes, sir, I am. OK, great, great, because I have it in notes view so I can see what my next slide looks like. All right. Now, if you receive a test document in an ordinary situation in a classroom, like a weekly quiz or something. It's a good idea to look over the entire test paper before you try to answer anything. I mean, one of the simplest things to do is to make sure that there are questions on the front and back. Even though I type in big letters over at the bottom of page one, I'll always have some student who didn't turn it over and didn't do questions 11 through 20. So yes, give the give the whole test a look see, but there are some particular reasons for that. One is, and this is kind of a teacher secret, but when we write tests, we write them in the order that we taught the material. So we'll write things from the start of the chapter, then the middle of the chapter, then the end of the chapter, because that's just naturally how our brain would work in putting together the questions. But here's the tip. When you scan the whole test paper first, you can't help but see that inside the test are going to be words and terms and phrases that go with the chapter or the story that you just read. So in a sense, this is kind of like looking at a set of notes. It could help your memory just by looking at the these important words and phrases. So that's one thing that's a good value. Secondly, you can get an idea of what kinds of questions, meaning the question types that appear on the exam. Let's say it was a math test and you've got some that are easy calculations and you've got some that are word problems. And you know from your experience, you like to take more time with word problems rather than just a straight math problem. Well, now you can think, all right, I got a 50 minute period. I've got three word problems. I want to make sure I leave half the period for the three word problems. So I only want to spend about 20 minutes on the easy calculations. So you can kind of figure out your work plan while you're scanning the test. Or would you rather turn the paper over with 10 minutes to go and go, oh no, there's three word problems on the back. 
So scoping out the whole test is a good thing to do. Now, in an online exam, obviously you can't do that because it releases one question at a time. But if you find yourself in a situation where you need to retake a quiz or a test, part of your brain ought to be trying to remember the questions that you have looked at so that you're a little bit familiar with what you will see on the retake. So even if it has some randomized questions and it, it draws on a big pool, you still have a little bit better idea of what's going on before the retake. So I think being aware of the whole exam is an important first tip. But then we get to the particular question. And each question is going to tell you how to answer it. Seriously, as teachers, we are not trying to trick you. We want to put the words of the question right there in front of you and tell you this is what a correct answer would look like. Please do this. So the clues and the tips oftentimes are buried right in the question itself. And here's how to do it. What type of question is it? Is it true, false, fill in the blank? So the question format is important. What does it want? Do I need to do a calculation? Do I need to just give it an important date from history? Do I need to write a complete sentence? So what is my task? And how many parts does it have? And this sometimes will trip students because they don't realize that there were multiple things to do in the question prompt. They saw the first one and they did that, but they didn't read the whole question to see that there was an additional task. So we're looking for those verbs like list, define, rank, explain, because if there are two or three of them in the question, that means you've got two or three things to do. You now, list the four parts of a marketing plan and define each of them. So it said list and it said define. So that means you've got two tasks to get full credit for the question. If it is allowed, meaning if I gave you a test paper in class, and said it was okay to write on the test, I would underline or circle those action words so that I could check them off to make sure I did all the parts. If it's a standardized test like the SAT where you get a test booklet that you have to turn back in, then you're not allowed to do that. But if I have an opportunity where it's okay for me to make a few notes to help myself, I'll do that so that I don't leave off any important parts of the question. The true false question. These ought to be easy, but sometimes students make them difficult. If I'm writing a true false question, the easiest way for me to do that is to take an exact quote from the book and either put it in just as it is and that would be true, or put it in and change a key word, and that would make it false. So if you can find the key word that ruins this definition or ruins this quote, then you can mark false. But here's the trick. Students overthink it by trying to imagine some exception. Like, well, water weighs 8.8 .8 pounds per gallon, uh, but that's fresh water at sea level. So in New Orleans, which is below sea level, it would weigh more. Or in Denver, which is a mile high, it would weigh less. So water doesn't always weigh 8.8 .8 pounds per gallon. Come on, don't overthink it. Something like that, the question is just asking, do you know the basic weight? So. When you go out of your way trying to think up some exception, you're probably taking a true statement and making it false in your own head. Beware of statements that have always and never in them, because those are indicating a condition that's 100% or 0% true. 
That's a case where you have to know your actual fact. But I always thought of a question that had always or never in it as kind of a warning sign because that means you have to know for sure that this thing is always that way or never that way. So those would be questions I would make sure I read carefully. Fill in the blank question. This is actually a close cousin to the true and false question. What the teacher will do is write the statement as if it was a true false question that was true. And then just take out a key word or two that requires you to put in what's necessary. This means you have to know what the true fact is so that you can complete the sentence. Now, if you take a look, and I know you can't read this quiz, but you'll notice that the, the blanks are in a particular place in a sentence. Like there in the fourth question, you see one of the blanks ends with apostrophe S. That indicates a possessive. So that must mean it's naming some person in that blank. So where the blank is located in a sentence can actually tell you whether you need a noun or a verb or an adjective because grammatically for the sentence to be correct, you have to put in the right part of speech. So while you're trying to figure out how to answer the question, see where the blank is situated within the question. And that will probably give you some clues as to what kind of word you need. Then when you realize, oh, it's thinking of a character's name, then you can start going through your memory of who the major characters were and who would fill in that scene from the story. So see again, the test is trying to tell you what it wants. If you have a list of spelling words or definitions or a glossary that goes with your reading, that's a great place where we get our true and uh, fill in the blank questions, excuse me. Because the fill in the blank question oftentimes is a definition that's just had a couple of key words erased. So if you know the definitions of your key terms, you might see them as a fill in the blank question. It might also ask for particular facts like names and dates and places. So it could say something like, when World War II started with the invasion of Poland in blank, you need to know that the blank should be 1939. So those are the kinds of questions that are really set up for fill in the blank. The multiple choice question, or as some teachers call it, multiple guess. There is a particular system for defeating a multiple choice question. And no, it's not when in doubt, mark C, because that doesn't always work. But let me give you a system for taking apart a multiple choice question. First, there's a technical term you should know. When we give you a multiple choice question, we think a lot about the wrong answers, which are called distractors. The correct answer and then some distractors to give you something to look at that is not correct. Now, a good distractor might be a good answer. It should look pretty reasonable, but it should have some flaw in it that makes it incorrect. A bad distractor, a poorly written part of the question would be an incorrect answer that is obviously incorrect. So if I said, which of these uh, head coaches has the most wins? And I said, uh, Don Shula, Tom Landry, Mickey Mouse. You know, Mickey Mouse was never a head coach. So that's just a dumb thing to put on the test. Most teachers get some training in how to write test questions so that 
they're not going to give you Mickey Mouse as an easy one to cross off. What you're trying to do is eliminate the bad answers to leave yourself with the good one. And let me show you how we can do that. So here's our sample question. Which of these three US presidents served the most years in office? So we have our list of five choices. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Hillary Clinton. So we got to go through these five and figure out which is the correct answer. Here's the way I would break it down. Hillary lost the election, so she was never president. So we can cross her off immediately. Boom, one down. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated after he got reelected. So he never served his second full term. So we could cross him off. George Washington, the first president, famously declined to run a third time, even though many people wanted him to. So he just did two terms and retired. Oh, wait a minute. There were two presidents called Roosevelt. And that's true. In fact, there were two called Adams. There were two called Harrison and there were two called Johnson. And only the Johnsons were not related to each other. So now we're down to the point where you have to know some facts, but you've got two answers. One of these is going to be the right one. Teddy Roosevelt ran for president three times, but only one twice. Franklin, his great nephew, ran four times and won four times. So even though he died in his fourth term, that's still more than 12 years. So that makes Franklin Roosevelt our correct answer. So you see, you start with the most wrong and work backwards and wind up with the correct one. Now, if you know it straight off, that's easy. But when you're unsure or when you have to try and use some logic to figure out where the right answer might be, this is a technique that you can use. I hate these kinds of questions, but they sometimes come up where it asks you, what is the best choice from these alternatives? And I put the warning sign for a tripping hazard because these questions can trip students. It's a special kind of multiple choice question because every answer is potentially correct. And it's asking you to make a higher kind of judgment to determine of these good, I excuse me, of these good ideas, which is the best idea. The question stems, as I say here, might say things like select the best course of action from the following or which is most likely to happen if. Here's what you need to know. What is the criteria for choosing a course of action? If I asked you what is the best route from Daytona to Tallahassee? You have a lot of problems because there are a lot of roads to choose from. What makes it best? If if you take the two lane roads and cut across the state, you see more pretty scenery. So if best means most scenic view, that would be one road. If you want to be able to drive as fast as legally allowed, then you want to be on interstate highway. So then you would drive north to Jacksonville and then west to Tallahassee. So if driving time was the criteria, that would mean a different route. If you wanted to know where there were um, more hotels or more gas stations, then you would want to cut through cities rather than be out in the country, or you might go for an hour before you see the next gas station. 
So defining what do we mean by best? What is the criteria for making the choice? That's the part that you need to know. Hopefully that's something that the teacher will have gone over with in discussing the strategy to go with whatever lesson this question comes from. But that's how you make your dividing line. How do we define best, most correct, most advantageous, most economical, whatever it is? The definition of that phrase is what will clue you in on how to answer the question. Now, matching questions, which you may see on some quizzes. For my part, I like these because it's a way that I can cover five or six things with one question. And where if a student knows them, they can get all six points. If you mess up one, though, you automatically mess up two because you've tied up two choices with mistakes. So let's figure out a process for getting through a series of matching questions. So I made a timely and easy one. Match the current National Football League team with its current city. Notice how I put current in all caps. A teacher who writes good test questions is not trying to trick you. So when I say current city, I'm acknowledging that sometimes teams move around. Sometimes they change their name. So I'm letting you know I want you to do it as it is now. So with any potentially complicated question, the teacher ought to give you a clue like that to make sure that you understand the context. So we got six team nicknames and we got six cities and we just have to link them up. But even an easy question like this could have some tricks in it. Let me show you where they are. The easy ones, a couple of teams that have not moved in decades. Cowboys have always been in Dallas. The Bears have always been in Chicago. Boom, boom. I know I got those right. I go ahead and mark them. Now I have to work on the ones that present a little bit of a challenge. So you're trying to find the tricky bits. We got two cities called New. We got two cities called Los and Los, which could be confusing. And we got two nicknames that start with R-A and R-A. So even if the teacher was not trying to make this potentially tricky, these are areas where a person could get confused. So I would look at these that had similarity and I would try to get them sorted so that I could eliminate those pairs. The Saints have always been in New Orleans. And if you know the song, when the Saints go marching in, you associate that with jazz and New Orleans. OK, so you got that one. The Jets have always been in New York even though they did change their nickname once and they do actually play in New Jersey rather than New York City, they still keep the name of New York. Okay, so there's a couple of them done. Now I got two more to figure out. The Rams are in Los Angeles. Now here's the funny story about them. They started in Cleveland. Then they moved to Los Angeles in the 1950s. Then they moved to St. Louis in the 1990s. Then they moved back to Los Angeles a few years ago. See why that word current in the question prompt is so important? And then that leaves us one team left. The Raiders started in Oakland, moved to Los Angeles for a few years, moved back to Oakland, and then moved to Las Vegas a couple of years ago. So see how I went from the easy matching to the kind of difficult matching to the most difficult matching. And that way you would at least know if I was confused about the last couple of things, I probably got two or four points out of this for sure. 
and I increased my chances of getting all six. I mentioned before that you should be careful about multi-part questions. So my caution is still here. Read for all the parts of the question. See if it's asking for a list and a definition, or if it's asking for a definition and use in a sentence. So it's, it's giving you the conditions to satisfy the question. Make sure that you find all those conditions. Now take a look at this little question from an earth science class. List the planets and put them in order of size. Whoa, that is a tricky question already. All right, we know there are eight planets because Pluto got downgraded a few years ago. But see, it says put them in order of size. That's probably not how you memorize them. You probably memorize them counting from the sun outward, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, so on. But if you do it by size, then it's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Oh, so make sure that you have read the whole question and all the conditions of the question. Then even after you have written it down, I would go back and look at the question again just to make sure I found all the parts. Because if it's list, define, use in a sentence, or list, define, and give an example, there could be multiple pieces. You want to make sure that you have found them all. That way you get full points for the question. This comes up to me a lot. Should I trust my first instinct? So when you're reading a question and you look at it and you go, OK, that's King George the third and you just write that down because you know it. Should you trust yourself? Yes. If you studied, you will know when you know something. And there's actually a scientific term for this, which is called epistemology. No, that's not going to be on the quiz. But we do have scientific studies of how it is that people learn, how we memorize things. For example, if I asked you to sing the national anthem and start at Rocket's Red Glare, you might be stuck for a minute because we learn songs in order of the words. We don't learn songs from the middle outward. That's called sequential learning, that we learn things in order, like that last question I talked about the planets. But when you know an answer and your brain comes up with it quickly, then that's just a thing you know. And if you know it and you know that's the right answer, mark it and move on. That way you can save your time for the more complicated questions or the ones that you have to figure out using one of these methods. But I've always believed that a person will know when they know the right answer. You've probably had this experience after you take a test in one of your classes. I'll bet you've had days where you walk out of the classroom going, I killed that one. I know I got a B, maybe an A. I knew almost all of that stuff. And when you know it, you know it. And there's other times when you come out and you go, I have no idea how I did. I think I did OK, but I wasn't sure about this one and this one and this one. So in our own minds, if we're honest with ourselves, we know if we've got it or not. So if you know you've got the answer to a question, mark it down and get on to the next one so that you save your test taking time for the ones that would give you some struggle. All right. Bonus. And I say this in two ways. Bonus questions are like free money. So bonus tips about how to take tests will treat them like free money also. First, on an essay question, whether it's long or short, 
make a little outline first. Even if all you're doing is jotting down your four ideas about World War II, write them down so that when you start writing your essay, you don't forget your third reason, your third idea. Because I'll bet some of you have had this experience where you walked out of a test and you were doing an essay and then you get in the hallway and you slap yourself in the head and go, man, I forgot to mention something. If you had made a little note to yourself, you could have put down all four of your ideas. Next, if there is a bonus question, always do it. The whole point of a bonus question is that you can't lose points if you get it wrong, but you might gain some. I had a professor once put on a test, a bonus question, and here it was. Tell me some other fact you learned in this unit about which I did not already ask a question. Have you ever had that happen where you studied something and they never asked a question about it and you think, man, I knew this other thing and I didn't get to use it. He gave us an open ended question where we could put in any other true fact that we had learned from him and he would give us some points for it. So that was good. And that's a nice way to make a bonus question. When I was teaching journalism, my bonus question would often be, what's the number one international news story today? Or what's the number one local sports story today? Because I was trying to encourage my students to watch the TV news or read the newspaper before they came to class. So they couldn't be wrong, but if they did think of something that was legitimate, I could give them some points. Here's my third bonus tip. Never leave a question blank. If you only know part of it, put down the part that you can remember. Because it could get you partial credit. But I can't give you any points for a blank space. This is kind of a funny story. When I was teaching over at the State Fire College in Ocala, I had a standing rule because I thought firefighter safety was always important. Because you know, if a firefighter gets hurt, he can't rescue anybody else. He can't rescue his partner. He's now part of the problem. So I always wanted to emphasize safety. So I told my classes, firefighter safety is never the wrong answer. I had a guy on one of my tests in a completely different subject, just right in the blank, firefighter safety. Had nothing to do with the question. But since I said safety was never the wrong answer, I still gave him five points. Because that was a true thing, and he at least wrote something down. If you leave a blank space on a test, your teacher cannot give you a break. So even if what you put in there has nothing to do with the question, but it was a good fact from the course. Like, I don't remember how Nick was related to Daisy in The Great Gatsby, but I do know that Gatsby used Nick to get to see Daisy. Okay, that's a true fact from the book. It wasn't what the question was about, but that was something I could give you a couple of points for remembering a plot point from the book. So if you got something good, something useful, put it in there. Just don't leave a white space. Take a chance. Even on standardized tests, oftentimes they will tell you before you sit down that it's okay to guess because they're counting correct answers. They're not counting the proportion of correct to incorrect. Oftentimes those tests are so long nobody can finish. But yeah, if you got to guess, guess something, put it in and keep moving. So be aware of the rules for the different types of tests and the different types of questions. And then that could help you get better scores. 
because you know how to work the test as well as that you studied the material. All right, that's all I've got for you today. If you have any questions, uh, you can certainly uh, unmute your microphone and ask me the question now. Anybody have any question or comment about the test taking techniques I talked about today? I don't have any notes there. OK, good. Now, like I said, I mentioned that um, we are going to put the link into an email for everybody so you can get to this recording, and I'll also put the link over on our website on Canvas. So look for that this afternoon. I'll give you a couple ways to be able to get to this. And I hope this one is especially useful that you might want to go back and look at it again before you have a quiz or an exam coming up. Otherwise, thank you for coming and we'll see you again same time and day next week, Tuesday at 11. And I'll send you out the link and the topic later on this week. All right, bye-bye everybody. Bye.